Hi, David and Helen. So good to have you with me today to have this conversation. Hi, Alec. Nice to be here. Nice yeah. to see you and nice to see you too, Helen. Absolutely. It's lovely to see you both. I decided to um, let, your, let you guys introduce yourselves um, because I have this list of the things that you, what you do and who you are, but maybe it's nicer for you guys to tell uh, the people that are listening who you guys are. Maybe you can start, David. Okay, uh, so I'm David Galanders. I am um, a husband uh, and a father of three children. And I also am an ACT trainer uh, and a clinical psychologist. Um, and I work primarily at the University of Edinburgh, uh, where I'm the head of clinical psychology. Helen? I'm Helen Boulderston. Um, I am uh, I'm a wife and a friend and a... Uh, I have been a clinical psychologist. I was working out this is my 32nd year of being a clinical psychologist um, and a mindfulness teacher and an ACT person and a um, compassion person. And I'm mostly based at Bournemouth University. I teach and do some research. Um, and I also write and uh, have a little kind of private practice. I see some clients and do a bit of training and supervision. I asked uh, the people here uh, today, like, I'm going to talk to these two wonderful people who have done so many things in psychology. And what would be the question you would like to ask them if you could, and they have the answer, what would be the question you would want to ask? Um, and the question that one of them said was, um, we hear a lot about how uh, the life that we lead, uh, when, when you get into trouble, maybe you're living a life that, that doesn't really suit you, where you're like um, trying to uh, follow a path that shouldn't really be the path that you should be following in some ways. And how um, can you find the courage um, and the insights to know how to change that? So this is a golden question, right? So <laughs> what would you say? Should I kick us off? Sure. I, I haven't got the answer, but I might be able to get the conversation going. Well, as you were asking the question, I was thinking, so the first difficult thing is turning your attention towards something that might be very painful. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the only way really that's possible is with kindness to self. Like whatever has led up to me being in this position that is not ideal and is not perhaps not good for me. Like I can only really investigate that and um, carefully consider that if I can for perhaps sustain periods of time have my attention with it and so if I make that really aversive like really painful and horrible through lots of kind of self-criticism or whatever then that then that's going to be um, it's going to just be much harder so for me the bedrock of anything around this has got to be is there any way I can find some gentleness or kindness to begin the process so that that's my my opening bid mm -hmm. okay I absolutely uh, can see that. And I think that if you, when I think about people I've seen or things like that in my own life, and I think about what would it have been like to have been aware of this concept of turning your awareness towards the thing with some compassion. Um, I think about how, um, how much more helpful that would be Mm -hmm. compared to the typical strategies that I myself might have used in the past or that um, people I've worked with might use fairly typically. Mm -hmm. you know, thing, things like pretending it's not an issue or, or just keeping it quiet and keeping it to oneself. Mm -hmm. 
or um, doing lots of activity to to prevent awareness of the thing being there, or you know, drugs or alcohol, or, yeah, all these different kind of things that that actually I think are extremely human and that people do. And and if and if you if you could just shortcut all the years of that yeah. by having this kind of guidance of well, try and turn towards it first. You know, try and let yourself be aware of it without running away. Mm-hmm. I think that would be. I mean, what a, what a starting point that would be. You know, everything else, as you say, I think could unfold from there. But it's just such a. It's not. It's not a natural place, I think, for human beings to start from. You know, our our instincts are to run. To fight, pretend, you know, uh, that kind of a thing. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, it, if if Helen, you're into mindfulness, um, then um, like if this, if you can do mindfulness, then you probably are more able to look at the thing, the thing <laughs> that is the happening thing. in your life that you really should be looking at. Um, that is really holding you back from living the life that, you know, that you might be more happier in or more satisfied in than, than you are when you don't. But sometimes looking at it just is so difficult to do. Absolutely. And mindfulness, like you can think about mindfulness as a kind of a context, a place in which um you might be able to kind of hold yourself steady enough and kindly enough to to do this really difficult thing. But I don't think mindfulness is the only context, the only place, but to to think about what do I need around me, like in the way of support. And that might be like inside me, like how I treat myself, how I talk to myself, or it might be like people or, but like what conditions and support might I need to really pay attention to this difficult thing. Mm -hmm. So mindfulness would be one way of doing that that's actually quite interesting because um as i've talked about this before on the podcast my sister um committed suicide in 2018 and i was i was so in shock for for a long time uh it took me quite some time to to become me again and uh, the thing that i knew at that moment was like quite as if it was an in- instinct like these are the type of friends that i need around me uh, now and this is the behavior that I need from people around me and I really started saying that to people like this is what I need and if you're if you can give that to me then that's great if you can that's okay but I cannot bear it if you don't so then I will look for other people around me to support me in this uh, which is I didn't say you're not good enough as a friend I just it was such a time to be so authentic with myself and with others and what I needed. And it really helped me through it to do that, to really look for that support. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Help me to dare to, to feel what it was that I, that I needed to feel and go through it. Uh, And my, my sense of, of hearing that is that you had an awareness, you know, of what you needed yeah, and I think that for many people, we we don't really even have that sense of awareness that we are walking through our lives fairly much on autopilot. Mm-hmm. You know, I can remember my life before encountering things like mindfulness and ACT, and you know, that's twenty years ago now. Um, that uh, that I think I really was largely on autopilot and just doing what was expected mm-hmm. uh, and what you ought to do, and you know. Um, and even, and even in the clinical psychology training, which, you know, I had a, a good sense of self-awareness, um, there was a sense of like doing what a clinical psychologist does and, you know, uh, having a career and, and that kind of a thing. And so I remember the first time that I heard someone talk about things like, can you ask for what you need? Mm-hmm. Or can you give yourself what you need? Or can you ask, can you give yourself kindness? And, and in honesty, for me, that was a question that was, it, it left me puzzled. And I found myself thinking, like, do people actually do that? Like, yeah. it, you know, it, it wasn't something that was at all part of my repertoire mm-hmm. or my vocabulary growing up. And, and so I think that sense of, you know, you, you had that sense, you know, incredibly painful thing that you 
spoke about just then, and it can, and you had this sense of an awareness of mm. I have needs, and I can express that I have needs, and I can ask for them. I think so many people actually, that's a little, you know, they're, they're, that's not articulated. They've, they've never been in a situation where people have asked them, you know, what do you need, and and it's okay to have needs. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess that the thing that helped me to look into it was, first of all, there was so much pain that it was like the, the best way to survive was to do that uh, in a very authentic way. Um, but also there was um, no more hiding possible. Um, and I think also this is not a situation where you need to find a solution, where you like what I see with people who go through, shall I stay or should I go in my job or in my, in my marriage, you know, very, sometimes very painful things in life, life changing decisions where people can barely stand still with what is my pain? What, what am I suffering from or off? And then they go into, but what else is there? I mean, what if I leave my husband, then what do I have? But Maybe you just like to look at why these questions pop up in the first place, but then they jump into what is it that that needs to be resolved? And there was nothing to resolve. I needed to just get through it. Um, uh. And I think that that urge to yeah. solve things, to move on to the next thing, like, um, and, you know, in therapy we do this, don't we? I mean, even in a therapy that's, that has acceptance in its title we're still you know in the in the service of the client's values you know what are their goals what are, and it's all about this kind of forward movement thing and about improving something and and so i was thinking you know that there are times in life most people's lives where we come to a dead halt like uh, uh, and and we have a perhaps we might have a period of time that is well, I think that the word for me is fallow, you know, like where you have a field that there's nothing growing in it for a while. Like, like, mm -hmm. and I think that that, we don't talk so much about that in, in therapy and in the acceptance world. Like we still have these subtle ways to be working on some kind of linear progression, but actually there are times in life where, where the kindness is being able to say, yeah, I'm just here right now. Like, and, you know, and and my job is to do this day, yeah. And then you know maybe do the next day, and the, and the, the and and of course what's what's so difficult is to trust that through that like, like nothing changes, n nothing stays the same. There will always be some change. But so I, yeah, I'm just playing with this idea of kind of um, that life is not a linear. A progression um, and that, that a real sense of acceptance will include and make space for periods in life that are where we're just keeping our head above the water. Mm -hmm. Does that does that make sense? Really? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. yeah. And I think that one of the things that I like about ACT is that um, it actually gives a fairly practical set of tools for therapists. Not, not, not that it's easy to do, it's not simple, but, but that awareness of, of what you just described, Helen, of, of if you're with a client where there's a significant grief issue or loss issue, and, and that you, if you have the kind of awareness to sort of recognize what you just said, oh, this is, this is person is in a period of fallow, this is normal, this is healthy for them to want to withdraw and, and to sort of maintain their own energy and not be looking outside of themselves, then, then I think that if you can catch it, that hook that we have as therapists of must be doing something, must be offering something, we can try and catch that and go, actually, no, this is exactly what this person needs is just a space, just a, you know, as you say, a, a period of kind of fallow or reflection. And, and I think, as you say, trusting the process. I mean, that's a, it's an amazing thing. I think that, um, you know, human beings have this huge capacity for grief and, mm -hmm. and, and loss equal to their capacity for love. Uh, and that um, as painful as, as grieving is, that, um, that we actually do have this mechanism for self-healing and adjustment and, and 
coming to terms with, making peace with, growing from it. And, and, and it's quite a natural kind of a thing. You know, I think, I think my experience of working with people towards end of life or people who've been bereaved has been that, that they, do, they do have a natural mechanism for kind of healing and coming through that as, as long as they don't put things in their own way, mm-hmm. like musts and shoulds and substance yeah. use and running away and all that kind of stuff. You know. I think the, the metaphor uh, that you use, Helen, uh, is, is an image that, that really resonates, like this is a field where nothing grows is is like um if then there is a therapist or even yourself or friends who are really going for okay let's see that there that something must grow there let's let's uh let's try and force it there sometimes it's just waiting for the next season to yeah and exactly. something will grow <laughs> something will happen yeah. yeah trusting that that'll happen i think because mm-hmm. uh, you have to kind of hold on to your sense of You know, if you're the family round about, you have to sort of hold on to your sense of powerlessness. I can't do anything. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it's really seeing grief and struggle not as things to be got through so that we can get on with real life again, yeah. but that this is also life. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah. This is part of what it is to be human. Like, exactly. We don't necessarily have to just race through this bit, even though it's horrible at the time. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I always like that. And at the same time, when I'm in it, I do not want to hear that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it just, it, just, it just so points at how, how uh, tricky our minds are. Yeah. You know, that, that even though you know this experience through your bones, there's still this part of you that says, yeah, but I don't want to have to. You know, surely there's a shortcut. <laughs> and, and that kind of don't want this yeah. it's kind of yeah. part of of the deal too isn't it like why would yeah. you want this if this is pain or grief or whatever it yeah. is so absolutely yeah yeah I, i always feel someone else probably does know a shortcut i just don't know it yet and <laughs> <laughs> other people know how this works <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah are there like moments in your life where you really needed this sense of knowledge and experience yourselves are you really like can say like for sure um so so for me when i think about that it 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 wasn't it's probably not so much like a a major life event it's more that i you reflect on what i was saying earlier that uh, i found myself on this path where i had done all the right things you know and, and and been a good boy gone to university and got a good degree and got a job and then been postgraduate training and, and, and you know in many ways I was pretty content I had a, a good life but in part of that I was also um, uh, uh, with a, a, a woman that I'd been at school with um, and uh, we had stayed together and got married and you know I, after we'd got divorced some of my friends were able to say, oh yeah, we, we didn't think that was working very well, but you can't say that when you're actually in the, in the middle of a thing. And so, and so for me, that sense of kind of like, you know, even the questions that you raised earlier, Annick, about a, a person perhaps thinking about, are they in the right relationship? Should I leave? Should I not leave? That really wasn't on my radar. It was just, it was not really a thing that I would do. I was in this relationship and that's how it was. And, you know, um, and almost kind of, blinding myself to the the fact that, that it wasn't that successful and that and being quite passive about being unable to do anything about that you know and not really having a despite being a psychologist not really having a rich vocabulary that would apply to me I could apply it to other people quite happily but have, not really having a rich emotional vocabulary about um, what was going to work for me and so that like had I if I could go back now and talk to that person then in in some senses I wouldn't do it because you know the paradox of time travel Mm -hmm. and uh, if I actually made anything change back then then I would not be in the happy place that I'm at now where where both me and my ex-wife are a lot happier Mm -hmm. um but yeah I think you know having having learned like paradoxically the 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 going through that ending of that relationship and the 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 decisions I had to make and the courage I had to, to, to actually go through that, that taught me an awful lot about 
what I could actually do and, and my own self-awareness and, mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. So, so it's that kind of thing that I suppose that, that um, not that I'd want, I wouldn't want to change anything. Uh, I have no regrets at all. Um, but, but I think had I been armed with that or had I been aware of these things earlier and been, had more of the sense of applying them within my own life, then, then there could have been, I don't know, maybe, maybe not a smoother thing, but who knows what might have happened. But do you know what I'm saying? Kind of, mm-hmm. uh, I, I feel that, that I've kind of, the person who I've become has really changed an awful lot in the last 15 years or so uh, in a way that I just didn't have this kind of orientation towards life mm-hmm. through my you know, 20s and early 30s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it means that, like, in a sense, um, touching upon or or standing still with the emotional level that you couldn't touch before is like a scary process and at the same time an enrichment that yeah. once that you know how to handle that, then it... Absolutely. And it, and for me, it, it's not just that it, it, it is the being able to sit with discomfort and kind of be aware of that and to, and to, uh, and to sort of you know, be willing to have that. And it's also this kind of uh, um, detachment or distancing that, that um, the stuff that my mind tells me, I just don't trust anymore. And I, I don't give into it. I don't, I, I, you know, it can still hook me, of course. Um, but, at the, but at the same time, I have this general sense of like, it, it's just going to talk at me and say these things and, and, and tell me stories about myself that, that actually are not not to be believed. Mm. <laughs> just, just, you know, it's going to do its thing. Yeah, I think it's sometimes it's really so powerful to see that for a while you can have these vast convictions about things in your life and yeah. there is no way out of it and you're sure that this is how it is and and you yeah. can explain to everyone this is what it means about me and yeah, exactly. yeah why it is the way it is and that there truly are no solutions and all of that and then all of a sudden you just shift uh and sometimes i think you need to say these things out loud and at the same time process in your mind is starting to say really because yeah. not that sure about that and then suddenly there's this shift and then you're in a totally different mindset and then there are solutions and you can see things but yeah sometimes it takes a distance to be able to look at it yeah true and it's a process you know it 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 comes and goes and and i think you know uh, helen was saying earlier about how life isn't particularly linear it's definitely i have a sense of circuit you go back over you know, lessons and, and repeat the same things. And ev- eventually you might be lucky enough to stop making the same mistakes. Yeah. And then you sort of find yourself encountering <laughs> encountering that kind of territory and realizing, oh yeah, last time I went there, let's, go, let's do this instead, if you have the courage for it. I was actually saying to, to uh, a client of mine, like now there is this gut feeling that tells me um, like, mm, this might not really suit my path and maybe I need to, you know, take a different direction. And so now I can feel it. Yeah, I can. And at the same time, I can still just run straight into the wrong path <laughs> and know it and feel it, but still, <laughs> because my mind tells me, yeah, you should go there. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess my... My story's a little bit different, David. So there've been some very clear events. Um, I, but my mum, my dad and my brother all died quite young. Um, and so um, having been the, the youngest child in the family, I was kind of last person standing. Um, and my brother was the person who died most recently and I had been a clinical psychologist for quite a lot of years by then. And so and so I grieved, but but there was a sense, I look back now, a sense of a kind of performative grief processing, like like I knew what it was I was meant to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did all, and I was a good client and a good therapist, and I did the things. Um, 
and eventually I kind of ground to a halt around that like you know there's a there's, that can only get you so far really can't it um and so and I, I was just thinking you know the conversation we've been having about acceptance and running away from like like a big part of the work for me has like I, you know I didn't want any of those things to happen like why would I I absolutely didn't um and and it is wearying isn't it to try and be with things that you absolutely hate and you really don't want and so like how to not as a performance for me but how to genuinely find a place where I could sit with the crappy stuff I mean that that you know that's that's ongoing um but I would also say, like, at the very same time that that was, you know, incredibly difficult for several years, there's a real values bit right in that. Because, like, for me, well, if people die young, then what does that say about me and my life and the things that I'm putting off doing because... Uh, the fantasy of having another 40 years means I don't have to kind of do the scary stuff right now and kind of like, so like there's, I mean, it's a, it's a tough gift to have, but there's a gift in that about really getting me focused on. So, you know, if I only get one go at this life and I don't know how long that's going to be, then what is it? What is it that matters? You know, so the Mary Oliver, I, I'm a huge Mary Oliver fan, and, you know, the, that Mary Oliver line in one of her poems, so what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Well, that that was what my life was like. Like, um, I had evidence that, um, you know, I might not have the luxury of faffing around for 40 years while I, you know, tried to work out if I had the courage to do some things or not. Mm. Yeah. That's so that resonates very much. So the, both of what you said, like the first thing uh, I, re I remember thinking um, I had done therapy before that my sister died and I and it, and I remember that when my therapist told me, you know, there's lots of grief that you should take care of or, or pay attention to in your life. And then I felt like, okay, so now I've cried for two weeks. So I guess that I've done my work and I've done it good. Right. Yeah. Can we yeah. move on now? Right. And, you know, I cannot fool myself in this one because uh, I was scared of of shall I do this process the same way? And as, and you, you said it very powerfully, David, it's like you can really blind yourself uh, into this or your mind can can really make you not see things as they are, but as you want to see them. And I really was scared of am I grieving right now or am I grieving just the way that I think that I need to do this and it's complicated and I want to cry and I'm not crying and I want to be angry but I'm not and aren't there like stages that I need to go through and then all of all of those questions that are really not you know really don't matter um so I try to find the way of of, of finding me and I guess that's what I've done I I guess that um that I really try to look into, okay, so I still have life and, um, and what to do with it. And someone at the funeral, at the funeral already said to me, um, for you, this means you need to only celebrate life even more. And I really felt like, really celebrate life? I don't know, this really doesn't feel like something that I'm wanting to do, or I don't know how to do it. And, um, a year later, my father-in-law died and he was quite old, um, like really natural age to, to die. And he, I remember that we did the funeral and the service, you know, in Belgium, we call this service like a celebration. And I was like, every time that I had the word in my mouth for my sister, it felt like Ugh, this is a wrong word. But then we celebrated his life at the funeral. And it was really, for me, remarkable that, and I really thought like, that's what I want. I want to be able to look back and really be able to celebrate my life. Mm -hmm. and, and having done the things that really make my heart filled with joy and gratefulness and uh, all of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I get that, the whole looking for essence when, when you're encountering a storm, such as you told. 
about. Yeah. yeah. And I think I think that also illustrates nicely this point about timing and about uh, the natural healing that that when this um, well-meaning friend spoke at your sister's funeral, you were in that fallow period that Helen was talking about. You were in the rawness of the pain, in fact, not even in the fallow period, in fact. And you just you you just couldn't hear that. That no. was that was something that was not possible. And yet, you know, the di- completely different situation a year later, but it made you link back to you know, this is more, this is what I want. This is a different way of being. Mm-hmm. I, I remember one time, just to sort of slightly change the subject, the uh, I was on a train and I met with uh, just a stranger on the train, and she was a woman from Ghana, and uh, I said. Uh, where are you going? I was, I was going down to London to do a training. So where are you going? She goes, I'm going back to Ghana. Uh, my father died a year ago and we have the funeral then. And you, you know, everyone is in grief and mourning and the mourning lasts for one year and then about a year after the person is buried, everyone goes back to the place where the person was buried and they, and they celebrate back to Ghana to, try to celebrate the end of her father's mourning. And I just thought, that's not a tradition that we have in Britain, mm-hmm. uh, you know, these days. I think the Victorians did have prescribed periods of mourning, uh, but but we don't have that. We, we have this kind of um, almost farcical idea that, well, once the person's in the ground, that's that, and, you know, you should be moving along now, and it really isn't the case. But I do think it, it, it speaks to this kind of natural healing and cyclical, you know, going over the same stuff over and over again, you know, yeah, and it is the, it is the same thing, I guess, for for everything that we encounter that is quite difficult. And and you know, I didn't know what to make of the, the the evening that the that I got the news about my sister. Uh, I'm sure you you know what I'm talking about, Helen. It's like you just there is no way to grasp it. It's just there is no way to make sense of it. Um, and in a way, I guess it's the same for everything that I've encountered in my life that I found difficult. Um, uh, very serious problems with friends or, you know, very difficult things to, to uh, I, I was chronically ill or I still am uh, chronically ill. Um, I had uh, uh, chronic fatigue and uh, fibromyalgia a few years ago. I was really, really sick. Um, and still it's, it is, I mean, I've, I've quite, uh, it's, it's not quite a big part of my life anymore, but it still is something to pay attention to. And, it's so easily said and done that when you go into your daily life that you're just rolling into things and you're just not talking with yourself anymore about what am I doing and is that really what I should be doing and can I be honest with myself and why am I forcing myself into things that I really don't feel happy about or we, we, we don't like this honest conversation because it often scares us to do so, I think. One of the things that I changed um, as a result of these losses and this kind of real sense of the preciousness of of the time I have was to change some of the ways that I, kind of questions I ask myself. So often I would find myself, particularly around work, asking a question like, is this something I can manage to do? Like, Like this sense of, well, if I can manage it, then I'll do it. Yeah. And so questions like, like what would be fun or how do I experience joy? Or, I mean, like I would never, like those questions, they were not part of my vocabulary, but there was a lot of, so so really thinking about, I mean, what a gift that is, you know, that, that these difficult things led to me think, having a range of ways to think about what I want to do with the time I've got mm-hmm. and it's not just about how much I can manage to get done you know so I feel really grateful about that we have a Belgian psychiatrist who once said that if clients come to him and talk about like I'm going through a divorce and I 
you know, I want some medication. I feel, I feel awful. And that he often then says, well, I'm not going to give you anything. You're just going to feel awful. This is an awful period in your life. And just, you know, you have to get through it. And there's nothing that we can do to make you feel better because that's what you should be feeling in an awful situation at the moment. So, you know, try and pace yourself and take it easy and just know this is what you're going through. This, these are life changing moments. That's they're they're coming along with life changing emotions and thoughts and yeah absolutely yeah. but i think that, i mean i think that's the on one level i think that is a, a really helpful message but obviously there are ways and ways of offering that message you know you know and um i think if for those in those periods that are very difficult very painful or where we feel very stuck or this kind of fallow periods if we can help ourselves or our clients take a perspective on them that's that's really useful like as an aside I mean this is a kind of silly example but it's um I have um I have a couple of close friends people I love dearly but who it really matters to them to be busy and to appear busy and um, and whereas um one of the things I really love doing is lying on my sofa, this sofa, this sofa here, doing pretty much nothing. And if challenged, I will say I'm metabolizing my stress hormones. Like and this is really <laughs> important work. And, you know, I have inherited a system that was shaped when, you know, if I'd been chased by a tiger, I would then have slunk off to the back of the cave and I would have laid down and I would have metabolized my stress hormones. And that's the job I'm doing. And so in those fallow periods, in a way, there are, there are jobs we're doing. We're like metabolizing grief. We're, we're, we're kind of letting our system settle. Like this is important work, but it doesn't look like it's active work from the outside. Yeah. Absolutely. I remember right after the divorce or actually before the divorce, right after the, when I sort of said to my uh, ex-wife that I we, we was leaving, uh, I remember that period after that time taking regular afternoon naps and, and just feeling absolutely exhausted and just wanting to go and have a lie down. And, and that's not something typically that I would do now or before, but, but that heavy you know, emotional processing kind of fatigue uh, was was just you know um, a floor, floored me really and and allowing myself to have those naps was really an important part uh, of the, of that processing. That reminds me of uh, I was talking to Graciela Rovner uh, is also one of the podcast interviews that I did and and it was very interesting to hear her talk about the importance of uh, moving uh, mm. your body, uh, but this is also equally as important to yeah to take time to process everything and stay close to yourself and let your body also be able to stay close to itself and not give yourself right. a hard time sorry yeah. go on david no i think you're right not 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 give yourself a hard time and think that it has to be anything other than what it is but what i was going to say it, it's about coming back to that point about raising your awareness of what is it that you need yeah. And, it, and, it, and it may be that if you're neglecting activity and neglecting being outside with people, that might be what you need. But it may be that if you feel forced into that, it's, it's not going to be a helpful kind of activity. And so what you might need is, you know, to pull the blanket over your head or, as you said, get in the back of the cave and lie down away from the scary monsters. Yeah. <laughs> you were saying something, Helen. Oh, just I just said um, and to not give yourself a hard time if you if you're in in that phase of lying on the sofa metabolizing your stress hormones or whatever your version of that is then yeah or taking naps in the afternoon then but i think david you're absolutely right i think the the danger is we we slide into some kind of you know what in act we might refer to as rule governed behavior like or or kind of habits around how we're being in the world so just trying to have a little bit of sensitivity to okay today like what where am i energetically like what got no so seeing if it's at all possible to respond and act based on how things are now rather than because we don't want to get stuck in any of these kind of ways of being do we if possible absolutely and, and i think that applies um 
very much to sort of chronic health problems. Um, you know, uh, you, you often see, you've mentioned anic, uh, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. You often see this pattern of behavior where, um, and I'm sure that Graciela might have spoken about this, where people try and sort of like, you know, um, basically busy themselves out of the hole of fatigue mm -hmm. and ending up feeling very, very more tired and withdrawn and sort of slumping and then resting for longer. And, and, and you know, I think what we have, when, when working with those um, kind of conditions, we have to sort of say, look, this is where you're at. This is what you can do. This is how you feel. Let's start from there. But, that's, but what, we're not, what we're not saying is that this is where it's going to end. Mm -hmm. You know, this is where we're starting from. And then what, what would be a tiny step more? And then what would be a tiny step more? And kind of building up that kind of energy level and tolerance in, in that kind of much more gradual way rather than this kind of boom bust that we very often see. And that, again, requires mindful awareness. Mm -hmm. So you can plan, you know, sort of like, what, how am I feeling? What am I going to do today? And, and how is that going to impact upon me? And, and, and what, what's my actual experience rather than, you know, the rules that I've learned about how this condition works, because quite often those rules, as you said, haven't become then much more narrow and rigid, and, and, and then we won't challenge them, um, and we'll stay within certain sort of tracks. I guess it's, it, or for me anyway, in what, what you guys are saying is that I, I often think that um, the key thing is how can you still really connect with yourself? What What is what is really going on for you? Um, what, what, is, what is going on um, beyond the, the, maybe the stories that you tell other people, beyond the anxiety that comes back every time, uh, the tired, uh, fatigue, you know, every, like what is going on underneath? Um, and I was wondering if we can help people think of or, or, or try and give people some like tips or advice and how can you come to a point where you know what is going on? How, how can people gather like courage or wisdom or I don't know, uh, for, for them to be able to sit down and look into the layers underneath? I think people often know. I think people often know what is going on underneath. I think they often just are so busy with whatever it is, emotion, tasks, behavior, um, thoughts, that they often don't get to that point of, uh, of clarity. Because I think often clarity is what we're missing. If you look at, for myself as well, if I look at chronic fatigue, and I would ask myself, like, okay, what is the level of, of energy that I have today? What are the things that I can do today? I often didn't, literally didn't know. Like, I don't know what I can do today. I mean, yesterday I almost did nothing and then I got tired anyway. So I don't know what it is that I can do today. Who knows? Um, but also when I'm very anxious about things that happen in my life, then often I cannot find the way to, you know, sit down and look at, What's really going on? So I'm thinking of how can we help people like find the way to do that? Well, I guess that way is going to be different for different people. One, as you were talking, one of the things I was thinking was that um, certainly historically, not so much now, but historically I was often quite blank inside. Like if, if, if a therapist or a trainer had asked me to, you know, turn your attention inside and see, you know, what thoughts are here. I had very little self-awareness. And I, I mean, I was it's really kind of quite blank inside. But if I wrote, then all kinds of interesting stuff came out. So, so some of this might be working out um, what way works for me in terms of, of connecting with my experience. And so, so definitely in my 20s and 30s in I just couldn't access you know just by sitting quietly what was happening inside so I think that's you know that, that there would be a range of ways there's no one right way of doing that is there absolutely and and as you said that um you know, I, I was having pretty much the same kind of thought, Helen, that, that, that for me, uh, there are just multiple paths through the forest, if you like, and, and different ones that will, that will 
come together in surprising ways at different times in, in the same person's life. So uh, sometimes it'll be a social thing. Like sometimes it's about uh, finding someone that you can actually talk to mm -hmm. who will, who will um, listen and will also help you to take perspective and, and will ask you questions or say things to you that, that really make you examine your own experience. You know, those, those friends that, that will um, not change the subject but will allow you to talk, you know, and, and, will, and will, will get you thinking. That's, that's one thing. And yet there's other times where I think like, well, I, this is a, an issue that I'm not ready to talk to anyone else about. I, I couldn't bring it to anybody. Uh, and so then the, the social aspect is not really, that's not going to be a path that's really accessible to you at that time. Well, and I think that can change. You know, I think, I think that can change over, over life or over time or what you might need at different times. Um, sometimes for me as well, um, uh, physical exercise and getting out for a run, you know, just being on my own, but doing something or, or sort of, you know, um, that kind of a thing or, or doing a job in the garden, you know, you can sort of lose yourself in it, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, you know, all kinds of different things. And then recently, I had sort of experienced in the last sort of few years, which if, you, if you'd have told me at the age of, say, 25, 26, that this is what I'd be doing, I would have, like, just ridiculed it because, you know, back then I was such a scientist, you know, everything had to be proven and evidence-based. Anyway, what I'm talking about is I got given a voucher. My wife, Sarah, gave me a voucher to go and have a, a massage at a place near here called the Yurt. And it's uh, this woman, Jen Gold, her company was called, she's and sadly she's um, wound down the company now, but the, the company is called Re Reconnect to Self. And she would do massage and Reiki and aromatherapy. And, you know, and, and I went there first time probably about two years ago. And I've been two or three times since. And it's just this really safe environment where you're in this kind of yurt in nature, silent, you can sort of hear the birds you get a, a reiki based massage with essential oils and you know it really leaves me with this feeling of of reconnecting to self of of of, of accepting myself and being sort of whole and uh in a way that has completely surprised me that that that, that would be something i'd be uh, able to uh enjoy and and uh, and not question you know <laughs> no not going you know what is all this reiki stuff it's you know so you know it, it, actually in, in that time i'm just like i'm not actually bothered what it is you know it feels nice and it makes me feel whole so 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 i think what i mean is that, that there's just lots of different routes and different ways in which we can stop and reconnect to ourselves and, and they may change over time and i think one of the troubles that you know if i if i was being guided by that more 25 year old self they would not they wouldn't have even thought about doing this you know and 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 they would then put in barriers to me actually finding out things and so much of that kind of like our history and our habits prevent us from going to places and prevent us from sort of developing self awareness um yeah i i'm I, thinking I think, of like you said we, were, we might be a bit frightened of self awareness sometimes i was thinking of the uh when i uh started up my business uh, years ago more than a decade ago, I remember working with, with my partner at that moment and I felt this isn't going anywhere. We, at a certain point, you know, we need to, to stop working together. And um, in the beginning, it, I was talking to friends and telling them what was going on and they were supportive and they would say like, you need to stop this. And, you know, we had this kind of, they they try to really be there for me. And, and at a certain point, I... I was actually quite happy that I could say, like, I am processing this. I don't know where this is going. And I, and maybe when I'm like half a year or a year later, I might say, my God, it's good that I've made this decision and it's, I should have made it sooner, but I'm not there yet. And I really don't know where this is going. And what I would like from you to do is let me just talk. I need to get over the, um, this isn't working and I need to, you know, th this pain, I, I want to talk to, to be able to, to get rid is, is the wrong word, but to get, 
past the pain and then to look at what is going on and can I dare to do that? And so let me talk. Don't, don't go for solutions because I, there is nothing that I can do with them because I'm thinking the same thing. One day I think I need to quit this and the other day I think we just need a good conversation and then I think I need to run and then, you know, and I'm so happy that I, I think that what I'm saying is that it's not like this one moment where you can just sit and then there it is, wisdom comes in, but you just know like I, I am walking into a period where things are unclear I am suffering and I need to acknowledge that I'm suffering and I'm looking for a way out and it's going to take some time. And I'm, I'm not going to let that go, that feeling of, okay, something isn't right. And I don't even know what it is, but I need to reconnect to it again and again and again. And maybe even then in the same process in different ways, but I'm looking. Um, I think that's absolutely right. And, and again, calls to mind this kind of circularity of going over the same ground in different kinds of ways. To, to me, the, the ability to talk about it out loud with somebody is, is a bit further along the path than, you know, I can relate to what Helen was saying about writing letters, you yeah. know, kind of writing to myself or writing a letter to somebody that I had no intention of sending uh, and, and sort of processes and process and going over that again. Sometimes it's almost like sort of uh, coming at a scary thing and giving it a first a once a once over I'm just going to go past quickly just to see yeah, and then yeah. I'll, I'll come back again when I realize it doesn't bite me too hard you know yeah, exactly uh, Absolutely. it's a bit like a field with a, a bull in it and you don't want to just run straight into the field like you want to just hang this side of the fence and have a quick peep and see and kind of weigh up how things are going to go and yeah you absolutely I think that kind of um, for me there's a, like a sense of just having a look out of the corner of my eye at something that's really difficult. And David, you know, one of the things you were saying, you know, maybe doing something else like running or gardening, but like in the background, yeah. this thing is whatever it is, you, it's working away. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas they're kind of attempting to go, right, this is my hour to focus on this thing head on. For me, it's often not effective. Yeah, exactly. I, uh, I've, I've learned that it's, it's really trying to find a way past the pain to not go like think about things when you're in the middle of hurt, but trying to just let that be and try and bear that and then go to when it's a bit more silent and your mind is less busy with dealing with pain that you can just go into, okay, so what's really happening here for me? And take a more silent kind of approach. Uh, yeah, I've really it can learned be like, that. Uh, waves. Yeah. Pain can be like waves in that kind of way, I think. And, and you know, the, the, when, when you're at the top of the wave and it's, you know, crashing over you, it, it, it really is just about survival. Yeah. Um, and, and, you, you know, once, once you get out of that kind of, you know, immediate crash, then is the time to sort of think, right, okay, where am I at with this? And when's the next wave coming? And what do I do next? And, the other thing that I was thinking was, you know, any kind of really tough time in life, like while that's going on, one of the things we really want to do is everything we can do to take care of ourselves while we're in that difficult situation around, you know, sleep and food and support and all of those things. And of course, ironically, sometimes that is the work. Like so, sometimes that, you know, if you can do the taking care of yourself while you're going through the tough period, actually the taking care of yourself is the thing that you needed to do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what else I want to say about that, but that's what came that to really me. resonates with me. Definitely. Yeah. yeah for and, me. and not necessarily, not necessarily even, uh, I mean, yes, it is super important as you're saying, when you're encountering some very difficult life event, but I think just in, in general life, you know, it, it's, um, you know, uh, keeping on top of all the busyness and at the same time looking after our well-being and drinking enough water and not eating crisps and sweets all the time. And, you know, in some senses, that's the work. You know, that, that, that kind of ability to sort of stay, um, you know, developing healthy habits that, that, you know, the ease with which it is easy to have unhealthy habits, you know, I and mean, that's pushed to us all the time in advertising and you know, um, tasty foods and tasty drinks and stuff like that, that, that actually, you know, 
that kind of level of sort of self-regulation is, I think, just it's part of the work, you know, and, and uh, it becomes even more important during times when we're going through a real difficult time. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, of, of many moments in my life where I thought this is what I need to do. I need to very uh, like if I want to feel happy that I need to like live this kind of perfect life where I drink enough, where I eat healthy, where I exercise enough, where I do mindfulness enough. And then my life will be perfect as I am at that moment. Um, and if I, if while you're saying this, I'm, I'm thinking of those moments and I'm thinking maybe the fact that I couldn't end up in those moments meant something was going on and I didn't feel good and I didn't feel the energy to take care of myself. So maybe the first thing is where we started the conversation when, when you said, Helen, like we need to um, be gentle on ourselves. And, and at that, that moment, maybe that is the starting point of, I, I, I don't have the energy to really take care of myself. I'm not well. Mm -hmm. And I need to recognize that that is the case. Things aren't going fluently. I'm fighting with myself and I'm fighting with my environment or things that I'm doing and um, like this and is it is, sorry it is so easy for self-care to become just another stick to beat yourself with isn't it I mean that like there's a difference between a an intention like to the best of my ability given the resources and I, I have right now will I treat myself with love as best I can knowing that you know Sometimes I, I will, you know, dinner will be crisps because that's all I can manage. Or is this, you know, rule number 307 on my list of very important rules to live by? And it, yeah, it's, oh, it's so easy to kind of slide mm. into that. Yeah. And to oscillate between those. And, you know, as, as I was listening to Annick's talk there, Helen, it reminded me of the way that we often start our um, use of self workshop together. Where, where we say you can only start from where you're at. You, know, you can't be anywhere else other than where you're at. Yeah, uh, yeah true. Mm -hmm. I think maybe that being said, we can uh, round up our conversation because that sounds like a very nice advice to, uh, to end our podcast. What do you guys think? Yeah, yeah we, absolutely. I think we could talk forever, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we, have, we, we, we do have to eventually end. And, yeah. <laughs>